My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I'll do it, my friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. You can't hope for rate cuts from the Federal Reserve and also expect zero weakness in any part of the economy that impacts your portfolio. Let me tell you, Wall Street wants to have it both ways, but we'll never get, get those rate cuts until the Fed sees cash-strapped consumers rebelling against higher prices, forcing companies to roll them back to pre-COVID levels. And that is what is at stake right here. And it's playing havoc with the averages. Dow sinking 234 points. S&P falling 0.77%. And the NASDAQ losing 1.05% again. <laughs> How can investors navigate these treacherous waters where we want just enough weakness in the economy to push the Fed to cut, but no damage whatsoever to the stocks of companies we own? Well, look no further than the stock of the Walt Disney Company. I follow Disney very closely. We own some for the Travel Trust. I like it in part because of the price. Disney traded at 123 and changed back in March. Board shareholders, especially the big index funds, voted against Nelson Pels, candy investor who wanted to join the board and offer advice on cutting costs and reorganizing the business. Now it trades at 86. And it sure even here feels precarious as no one seems to care at all about the value of this story franchise. Today, the company reported what looked like on the surface a terrific quarter, and initially the stock jumped up five bucks in pre market trading. Then Disney quickly reversed and only finished the day down $4. Not, really, not unlike the Dow Jones average, where things looked real good in the morning, then dripped lower the rest of the day. Emblematic. Disney's actually the perfect microcosm for the moment. They've got a bunch of important divisions, like movies, where Disney's crushing them. Terrific schedule. I think like huge hits like Inside Out 2, Deadpool, and Wolverine. Seems like the movie drought's over. ESPN held in with ad revenues up 17%. Good news, despite the cord cutting. But what got me excited about the company's results? The amazing profit, a quarter ahead of time from Disney+. Plus. I figured it would disappoint us again, and maybe even again. And we hear the usual refrain, only Netflix knows streaming. Disney will never get it together. Wrong. Move over Netflix, or at least slide over a little, because Disney Plus pulled it off, delivering a real profit. It did so a quarter earlier than planned. That, to me, was the real story of the day. But uh uh-uh, not in this kind of market. If Disney was so good, you're probably wondering, what the heck did the stock get beaten black and blue today for? And the answer is exactly why we need a rate cut. And we need a rate cut right now. The consumer no longer seems willing to pay up for these storied and treasured family-friendly theme parks. Long the most consistent part of the Disney mosaic, you can count on them. The parks fail to deliver this time, fail to deliver big. I don't know if they can deliver in this environment because they may be too expensive for the newly frugal and choosy consumer. Sure, the parks are exciting, but when you have to pay $734 to spend a night at the Grand Floridian or $635 a night at the Polynesian or even $526 a night for the night uh, at the Contemporary, all on top of the 109 standard theme park ticket price, 109 bucks, well, consumers are going to have to make a choice. And maybe the choice is to not go to the Magic Kingdom. And that's why Disney's domestic parks operating income fell a pretty shocking 6%. But if management's saying this demand moderation could impact the next few quarters. So what choice is the consumer making instead? Perhaps she's choosing to go on a non-Disney cruise, perhaps one owned by Royal Caribbean which is mostly sold out, judging by what the company had to say about the state of their business. And their stocks are telling you that the state is pretty darn good. While Magic Kingdom room rates are expensive, Royals, Western Caribbean, and Perfect Day Cruise will only set you back $114 a night. Bermuda, $132. You can sell five days for the price of one overnight room at the Floridian. The consumer still wants to go person. They definitely want to go. They want to travel. Post-COVID, you can only live once instinct still with us. Top of the list of things that we're spending on. Right out of the pandemic, people were more than happy to pay Disney prices. But we've changed. We're now a lot more choosy after years of higher prices, inflated prices. We're done. We're done. You can have a terrific time on a cruise and take just as good pictures for your Instagram without Mickey or Pluto photobombing your Insta action. Despite all the negativity, I come back and say, well, wait a second, wait a second. There are other things besides just theme parks 
You can get this incredible franchise for just over 17 times earnings. Much cheaper than the average stock. I haven't seen this cheap in a very long time. I told people along the investing club today at our morning meeting at 1020 that I am itching to buy back the stock we sold much higher if the pelts fracas. I think the park's problem can be solved, unlike the streaming profitability problem, which I thought would would just kind of be with us for a while. Because the rest of Disney is at last working so well, you know what they can do? They have the ability to cut prices at the parks if they want to, even as I know those places cost a fortune to run. And I'm confident that the Fed will cut rates, which could take the pressure off the consumer away from the parks. What happens then? Well, I think Disney's parks bounce back because it's not like they've lost their relevance. It's not like they've stopped being great places to go. They're just more expensive than the alternatives, like cruises. Fortunately, Disney has a cruise line of its own. It's expanding, but not fast enough. And the gross margins on new ships are getting in. Well, they're not as attractive as the broken-in ships. Of course, I brought up Disney not just to harp on the fact that I think it's a bargain here. And yes, if it goes to 80, it'll be more of a bargain. I brought it up because it's emblematic of problems that many companies are having. One of my favorites, Airbnb, told us just last night that it's seeing a slowing in domestic bookings again. Something that's new, something that's worrisome. It dovetails with what Marriott's seeing, another good operator. I thought Airbnb was such a bargain, it wouldn't get hurt. But right now, consumers are under such pressure that Airbnb seems pricier than we thought. Also, if you bought your home with a high mortgage rate in the last couple of years, you're going to charge more to rent it. And then maybe it doesn't get taken. Unfortunately, you can't roll back Airbnb prices in some central office, but I sense that some deflation's coming here, too. Now, we know the consumer's uh, 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 odd sometimes in making her choices. I mean, she's still spending a ton on Ubers and is willing to pay through the nose for, for restaurant food deliveries, accepting the total DoorDash charges on each sale. Why? You know what? Different things occurred during COVID. I think the consumer learned to love the convenience during COVID and now just doesn't want to give it up. When you hear economists talk about this process, you know what they call it? They call it normalization. The end of all sorts of exaggerations we saw because of COVID or the perhaps the post-COVID supply chain hangover. The consumer got real liquid from doing nothing during the pandemic and was willing to accept the higher prices of theme parks, but that's no longer the case. We have what I call an empowered consumer. And that consumer is going to force rollbacks on price by voting with her feet. She isn't mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. She's just mad at some options and happy with others because they're cheaper and better. Bottom line, the Fed can rejoice and stretch the time before it cuts rates until it sees the Disney's of the world cut prices en masse. Or it can anticipate what's going to happen and move now. I think it does the latter, but the consumer's still not going to come back to Disney World until the Grand Floridian drops to the price of the Polynesian and the Polynesian dips to the price of the Contemporary. Until then, the stock will languish like so many companies that have tried to hold the line on high prices because that's now a losing proposition, a losing proposition to which both Wall Street and the consumers rebelling. Let's go to Luke in Louisiana. Luke. Booyah, Mr. Kramer. Booyah, Luke. What's going on? It's good to talk to you. I'm, I'm calling about IBM, Big Blue. I... Uh... I usually just bet on LSU to beat Arkansas, and that's candy from a baby. But I've been looking at IBM, and the market cap has been holding here for 20, 25 years. Now I'm hearing about quantum computing. I'm hearing about that they're the forerunner in commercial security. Is quantum computing the real deal? Will IBM, Big Blue, you don't finally need quantum break computing to be. You don't need quantum computing to be the real deal. They are just executing. Like, I, uh, they are actually like a fast Gillette razor. I got to tell you, I really like what's going on there. I think the stock's valuation is not stretched. You still get the dividend. They're doing a terrific job, I think. Bye, bye, bye. Mike in Oregon. Mike. Hey, Jim. Beaver Mike here. Hey, uh, I, I'm looking to increase my industrial exposure. I already own Honeywell and Stanley Black & Decker and, con- and considering starting a new position in either Eaton or Dover. Given the current market, which of the two would you recommend to start with, or is there something else? Okay, I no, no, and I think they're both great. Now, both of them are connected to the data center, if you know, but Dover has less data center as a percentage of its a mosaic than Eaton does. I would say buy Dover right here. I'd pull the trigger. You know, because you're a club member. I can tell. That's the one you want right here is Dover. Let's go to Daniel in Alabama. Daniel. Jim, booyah. First booyah, time, Daniel. Long time listener. Roll time, man. Hey, first okay. my mom, my dad, and my Aunt Elaine. Hey, so my question is about Moderna, all right? So pre-pandemic buyer, I've seen the process. I've trimmed along the way. 
get a little knee jerk with price action recently. What do you think about that one outlook wise? Okay, I think that Moderna, I was hoping they could use AI to solve the puzzle here, but Moderna's not producing the personalized cancer vaccines that I thought they would. And that is a lot, like a lot of other people, we feel let down by the company. We feel let down that, Ms., that Ms. Bansell, Stefan Bansell, has not been able to crack the code of cancer with personalized vaccines. And that's why that stock keeps going down. All right, listen, the Fed can rejoice and stretch the times before it cuts rates until it sees the Disney's of the world cut prices on mass. That's one way to look at it. Or it can anticipate that that's what is going to happen and start cutting re- interest rates real soon. Oh, man, buddy, tonight, CBS Health chopped its 2024 forecast for a third time this year with the stock heading lower on the news. I'm checking the company's vitals in my post earnings exclusive. Then the stock of Celsius has been a dog lately, but what the heck? They just reported another record quarter. What's going on? I'm talking to the CEO. And Devon Energy is moving higher after earnings. I'm drilling down on what's next for what could be, end up being the premier independent oil company in this country. We'll sit down with the company's top brass. Stable family. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. All right, what's it going to take for CVS Health to turn itself around? We know the drugstore space has been in trouble, but this is the drugstore that's done the most to diversify away from its core business. And at the moment, right now, it may not be working. This morning, CVS reported, and while the results were pretty solid, they also cut their full-year earnings forecast for the third time because their managed care business, the old Aetna, is under pressure. Management originally got it for the earnings of at least eight fifty per share at their investor day last December. They cut it at least to eight thirty in February, we're cutting it again to at least seven in May, and now they're saying maybe 640 or 665. Very hard. But what's the broader plan to turn things around? And we know it can be turned around. So let's go straight to the source with Karen Lynch, the president and CEO of CVS, to find out. Ms. Lynch, welcome back to Mad Money. Thanks, Jim. Nice to see you. All right, so Karen, that, that's a tough litany, we know. Uh, we know you're also up to it because you are taking direct charge of the area that a lot of people feel is now causing some problems, which is the health care benefits segment. Don't want to get the cart before the horse, but you've solved a lot of the problems so far, even since we talked to you in January. But now this one's popped up. Yeah, Jim, let's just take a step back. I think okay. you have to look at the, the totality of the business. You know, many of our businesses are performing well. Our retail business, our pharmacy business performing well. We have the best market share that we've ever had. And our Caremark business, our PBM, doing well, had a very solid uh, performance in the quarter. Our problem, as you said, is is the Aetna business. We've had some challenges. The industry has had some challenges. And uh, I, as I said this morning, I wasn't happy with the financial performance of that business. I'm taking direct ownership and am going to focus on the financial and operational execution of that business. Well, it's tough because there was a time when you were... Uh, not highly, you're at, it wasn't rated enough, they weren't giving enough to customers, and then you went the other way and you gave a lot to customers, you became the favorite plan. How do you balance these things? Because to me, it, it, it takes a wizard to do it. Well, I think you have to really, it's all about focus and discipline, and I feel really good about our Medicare pricing for 2025. We took an enterprise-wide approach. We brought all of our resources to bear. We feel really good about where we're headed for our pricing for 2025, and we expect to recover margins of uh, one to two uh, basis points next year. Now, when this whole idea was put together, some of it was defense. They felt like, look, you want to use the bricks and mortars, got to use them for more than just uh, Amazon carry-on, so to speak. You make it so that you can use it as an entry to bigger healthcare situations. Now, Oak Street uh, Health and Signify seem to be working. Uh, you're absolutely right that when it comes to where we get our shots, we go to we know to go to CVS. Of the stores that are still uh, that you kept open, you say they're almost all profitable. So, I mean, if this piece fell into place, this health care benefits, could you have the leverage model to get eight dollars in earnings or more? Our goal, is, you know, we have, we have really strong momentum going into 2025. You said it. Our pharmacy business is performing well. Our Oak Street uh, business is performing as as expected. Signify had a record number of home visits and we ha- expect to see. Um, you know, positive momentum through our Medicare pricing, through our, we've had really good success in our national accounts in Caremark and Aetna. 
we, we introduced a productivity uh, initiative today as well. So we're pleased about where we think 2025 will land. Okay, now on April 30th, Walmart decided to close uh, its Walmart Healthcare Services Division. There were 51 clinics. Uh, they tried it for five years. They even had 4,600 pharmacies. They said they could not make it work. Reimbursement environment and escalating operating costs create a lack of profitability that makes the care, uh, case, care business unsustainable. How do you feel about what they did and your model versus theirs that makes it so that you can do it? Even though Walmart's got the balance sheet in the industry, they had the dropout. Well, think about this. We have an intentional strategy to give consumers what they want. They want clear access, they want affordability, and they want low cost. And so what we've done with Oak Street is really focused on Medicare members who have chronic conditions. It is a very targeted strategy to support the Medicare population. We have an insurance business where we have Medicare business, uh, Medicare members. So we are having um, good success. We have tripled the number of Aetna members in our Oak Street clinics since we've had Oak Street. And I think you know, if you look at our strategy, it's the right strategy at the right time. Okay, so the stores that are left, are they bringing in more than just customers, so to speak? Because we do know that, say, when Amazon does its Amazon Prime, they're really in some ways targeting CVS and Walgreens. I mean, are you able to withstand an, uh, an online company that is incredibly low cost and withstand them because of all these ancillary things that you bring in? Is it, uh, the bricks and mortar strategy is working with you. The bricks and mortar strategy is working with us. We actually ha- you know, have said that we have to be in a community to um, provide pharmacy uh, benefits, to provide um, immunizations. We talked about that before the show. And what we've been doing is changing some of the formats to include Oak Street, and a pharmacy, and we're starting to see traction there as well. Okay, now the New York Times just penned a story about zombie pharmacies. This is a problem that they said is all over the country, particularly acute in New York, and they mentioned CVS. They say that when you are trying to get at trying to get out of them, that you still have to pay the lease because the leases are so high that the landlord doesn't want to bother to release. They want to make it so that you pay. Is this a problem or are you almost out of that uh, of the, the zombie store business and all your places are relevant? I think, you know, we have had a a very clear strategy over the course of the last uh, three years to reduce the uh, 900 stores. We've reduced those 900 stores. We have 851. We have a couple left, and we feel confident in our strategy about uh, the number of stores we have. Okay, in January, you told me that you were piloting the idea that maybe self-checkout was uh, where Pilferage was, and you were trying trying to figure out whether to scale it back. Where is Pilferage? And how have you done with self-checkout? It is a great question. We still are seeing uh, theft. Uh, It is uh, still challenging us. We've seen less of it. But you'll be happy to know that we are introducing new technology for loyal customers uh, like you. Uh, We're piloting in New York stores where if you are a CVS Health customer, you'll be able to use your phone and a QR code. And then you'll be able to unlock the the, oh, that's the so lock right. that's locking up. I don't have the, to press a button. No, you'll be able to unlock it with a QR code. We have actually a couple stores in New York that we're um, piloting it right now. So maybe a store near here. That's brilliant. That's we're the very secret. Excited about You've got technology. It. You got the idea. Yeah. Well, that's fabulous. We just have to fix the theft. But right. now we have an election coming up. I mean, how much do you have to sit there and parse through what people are saying? Uh, each presidential candidate, and how much of it is really state versus federal that you have to worry about? Well, I think the way you have to think about it is we're in the healthcare business, and we're here to serve healthcare and meet the needs of uh, the demand of consumers and their healthcare needs. That doesn't it doesn't matter who's in office. Healthcare is personal, and that's what we're trying to achieve lower cost, affordability, and quality of health care. That matters to consumers, and it doesn't matter um, what, what the election bears. That's our objective, that's our goal, and that's our strategy. Okay, one is thought. It's a thought. I know it's not what you want, but it's the way that you want to value things. I look at your company, and I think the sum of the parts of this darn thing is so much more than what it's selling for. At the same time, though, that's not the goal, is to break the company up, is it? We have an integrated uh, strategy, and that strategy is working. We're seeing traction across all parts of the strategy. And as you might imagine, we always uh, look at our strategy, and we uh, evaluate it in the terms of our long-term shareholders. But if you had unlimited capital, would you put it behind uh, the brick and mortar? Would you put it behind Oak Street? Would you put it behind Signify or or Aetna? Where would the chips go? The chips right now would go into um, fixing healthcare, uh, fixing the, the business. Obviously, that's where uh, our my focus is because the other parts of the business are performing well. Right, will you look me in the eye and tell me that you can do a better job? I know you made a replacement. I know how hard that is. I've had to do it myself. 
that you can deliver on this on the Aetna portion. My, because if you can, you know you're going to have a lot more than eight yeah, bucks. Yeah, my commitment power. is I know this business, I know it well, I know where the opportunities are, I know where the issues are, and I am very focused on it right now. Well, if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. That's Karen Lynch, President CEO of CVS Health. We all go there. It's our pharmacy. Maybe it's the Aetna hidden piece that's holding it back that can change. Bad money's back in the break. Coming up, the stock with a can-do attitude, taking the temperature of Celsius. Next. Okay, what the heck is happening to Celsius? It's a formerly high-flying energy drink maker. Seen its stock plunge from the 90s in May to the high 30s today? Now, some of that's purely thanks to the rotation out of fast growers with enormous gains. Celsius has become a prime target for profit-taking because it's still up more than 2,500% over the past five years. Now, we got to ask you something else going on. When Celsius reported yesterday morning, they reported record second quarter results. Management also made some somber comments about the state of the broader energy drink category not the company itself, and stock finished down more than 2%. Let's check in with John Fieldley. He's the chairman, president, and CEO of Celsius Holdings. You got a better sense of the quarter. What comes next? Mr. Fieldley, welcome back to Mad Money. Glad to be here. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what I see, I see happening here, John. I think you've got the best house in what increasingly people are thinking is a bad neighborhood. Does the neighborhood have to get better for your stock to fly? Well, Jim, you just broke, we just broke record revenues, $400 million in revenue, $100 million in EBITDA, best quarter in company history. You know, we were a little bit somber talking about the consumer. Yes. Saw the category decrease for the first time since 2020 on a weekly read. It was growing strong in the beginning of the year. But the reality of it is, Jim, the sh- sugar-free category continues to be the growth driver in energy category, and Celsius is the category driver of growth. 47% of the growth in the category is coming from Celsius. We got an amazing sugar-free portfolio, most refreshing energy drinks out there. Just, you know, we we'll talk about summer. What better than to have a water- watermelon lemonade? I got one today. Absolutely amazing. Now, how about new entrants? Is it competition? Remember, I'm trying to figure out why you have a 12% short position. I'm trying to figure out why the stock did, doesn't have what I what Monster had. But remember, Monster was the greatest performing stock over a 30 year period. I had thought and still think that Celsius could. I'm trying to figure out what is holding back the stock because it's not the company. It's not the fundamentals. Well, I think, you know, when you look at it, the fundamentals are strong. You look at the category, you know, there's a lot of concern. You hear a lot about the consumer. We're hearing a lot of analysts on Wall Street are saying, you know, the category energy category has been the growth driver. It's transitory. A lot of people expect it to be pick up at the end of the year, right. start to see growth back. Energy is a, a lot of people see it as a luxury and it's an affordable luxury. Rodney and Hilton talked about it on their earnings call today uh, on the monster call. It, it, energy category is not slowing down. More consumers come in. We need more energy. Celsius provides that better for you energy. Uh, we're in good shape long term. OK, now, most recent study that says uh, that makes healthcare claims is all the way back 15 years ago. Anything new, anything that updated, anything I can point to, which tells people how good this is for you. The product, we take great pride where we're premium new products. Studies, new we, studies. We, we, don't, we don't have any new studies out yet, but premium product, premium ingredients. Um, quality is top notch within the product. We stand by it 100 percent. All right. Now, what is the deal with PepsiCo and the inventory problem? <laughs> PepsiCo is more than 50 percent of your distribution. It's absolutely true. It you can't get crosswise with Pepsi. You have to stay right with Pepsi. Correct. At the same time, I don't want to hear anymore about this inventory adjustment and the 20 million and 30. That's too hard for me. And I am a student and drinker of Celsius. When can we clear up this inventory problem with PepsiCo? You know, you know, Jim, I think when you look at it, there is a we're still getting to know each other. There's optimization in the really? inventory Really? Come levels. on, Ramon and I will all go out for dinner. I call Ramon. <laughs> He's, He's a dynamite. Great, great business. They, they're adjusting inventories. They're days on hand. It can be affected. I mean, you're seeing slowdown in, in the category. But, I mean, like the rock star. The rock star's like, they're your enemy. It's not a frenemy there. Rock star's owned by them. I mean, it what is. are we doing here? Hey, Celsius is driving the category. We're driving the energy drink cap portfolio for them. Great partners, driving truck share. Uh, they're leaning in. We just did an incentive program with them to help us further lean in for the back crowds. We want to drive this category. Both Pepsi and Celsius are fully aligned to do it. Okay, international. Tell me, you got 95% of your shares coming from North America. How yeah. wide open is the field? It's wide open. Uh, we partnered with Suntory to a variety of markets. Just launched Those in guys Canada. Are smart guys. They are super smart yeah. guys. They know exactly what they're doing. Great partners. We partnered with them. The UK, Ireland, 
France is going to come later in the year. Australia, New Zealand, we're talking about other markets uh, as well and expansion. Same health and wellness trends in the U.S. are global trends, right? Better for you, right. better ingredients without sacrifice and flavor. We nail that. More function in the beverages, foods we consume. We want more. Celsius is more than an energy drink. And fitness is a lifestyle position aligned and, with everyone today. And we do know, look, Lily's going to report tomorrow. Oh, it'll be terrible. Oh, the stock's only up a gazillion points. Um, but we know that GOP-1 actually does better with this. This is about one of the few categories that we can point to and say, yes, this does better. This in, a, in, in raspberries. Yeah, no, I Whatever. agree. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're seeing any lift at all from... We see a lot of, uh, you know, it, that's, a, that's a great category for us. Everyone wants to live healthy. We're all about living fit. They do? You know, look then why are so many people obese? <laughs> Interesting question. I got you on that. No, but you've got the Olympic partnership. How's that work? Oh, amazing. I didn't, I've been here over 13 years to have us partner with Olympians like Noah Lyons, the fastest man. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, he's pretty funny, too. All right, one last question. You know who I've got, who I love on your board. You know I love Caroline Levy. Now, what is she telling you? What does she tell you about the short position? What does she tell you about what you should do? This is the foremost analyst, beverage analyst of our lifetime is on your board. Absolutely. Tell me what she's saying. She is amazing. It's an honor to have her. Um, you know, we need to be true to the street. We need to continue to stay focused on our core is she, business. Is she shocked at the, at the short position, given the numbers? Yeah, but there's a lot of disruption in the category when you see the consumers and concerns. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, we need to execute. we got a great strategy. we got a, a lot of great big bets coming up from F1, further partnerships with MLS, our Live Fit tour. we got a great strategy. We need to execute. At the end of the day, we need to execute, and the stock's going to fall where it falls uh, or grow where it needs to grow. Fair and enough. Huge opportunity. We need to focus on the business, and that's what we're doing. That's exactly what I want you to do. Let Caroline do focus a little bit on the stock because there's nobody better than she is. All right, that's John Field. He's the chair, president, and CEO of Celsius. And believe me, I wish I had an answer about why the stock goes down because I think the stock should be going higher. They have money's back after the break. Coming up, this energy play climbed after earnings. A snapshot of the quarter with the CEO when Mad Money returns. Over the past month, the energy stocks have been clobbered by falling oil and gas prices. Wall Street's freaking out about a potential recession. That's what happens. Or we're at least worried about a meaningful slowdown. But i got to wonder, if this isn't the great buying opportunity we need, because every sign of weakness at this point simply gives the Federal Reserve more reason to cut interest rates. And that sends stocks back up, particularly oil stocks. What might be worth buying here? How about Devon Energy? Heavy hitter in the exploration production space, ported a strong quarter last night, probably one of the best in the oil industry, if not the best. It was a 15 cent earnings beat off a $1.26 basis, higher than expected production, especially oil production. On top of that, management raised their four-year production guidance. In response, the stock jumped almost 3% today in a kind of a lousy day. More important, once the Fed starts cutting rates, you know I think that this could go much higher. Plus, when Devin makes much more money, you know what? They give a lot of it to the shareholders generous variable dividend structure, and share repurchase commitments. So let's take a closer look with Rick Moncrief, the president and CEO of Devon Energy and an old friend of the show, to see what's going on. Mr. Moncrief, welcome back to Mad Money. Hey, Jim. Good to see you this afternoon. Well, Thanks for great. the invitation. It, it's great to see you. And I've got to tell you, Rick, this combination of companies that you put together, including the new one in Williston, which you know better than anyone in the country, is going to make it so that you'll probably be one of the largest independents in the entire country, if not the world, is the goal to be a true major built by Rick Moncrief. No, Jim, you know, that's uh, that's that's nice to say. But the reality is our, our our mission is let's build a good company. Let's build a great company and one that uh, we run the right way. We're very disciplined. Um, we're good stewards of capital, good stewards of the land, good stewards of the people. And that's that's our goal. And uh, you know, we, we really are are pleased with where we're at, what we've accomplished thus far. We've got a lot of opportunity, a lot of hard work ahead of us. Well, one thing Rick Moncrease is known as a great operator, when you increase production 7% with actually no increase in cost, and you, and decline in cost, how are you capable of doing that? That's, the, that's something that almost no one else can have really much luck at doing. Well, Jim, it comes down to assets and people. And, and I can tell you that we have some tremendous assets in the five basins that we operate in. It's headlined by the Delaware Basin out in the Permian, and we have some of the best acreage out there. You, know, you don't have to just ask us. You can ask anyone else. Uh, but it's also the people, and you have to have the right people, the right background. And I can tell you the, the combination we did four years ago, we've got the best of the best and uh, really pleased with how, how things are going. We had to hit the reset button. 
quite honestly, he, right. you know, about 12 months ago, tightened a few things up. We've done that. And I'm incredibly proud of where this organization's at right now. Okay, when you made a recent acquisition in the area that I said you know, Williston, some of the there were critics who said maybe you gave too much stock away. Some people don't really understand Williston; they want to stay in Delaware. But you always got that basin. Why were you so attracted to that, and even willing to part with stock, which I know you find very dear? Right. Well, the the transaction was two thirds cash, two thirds uh, excuse me, two thirds cash, one third third stock. And so uh, that's that's what the, what the buyers preferred. And so we went back and forth with that. But that's where we landed. We're comfortable with that. We think it's uh, a great investment for them as well. But we really think it uh, strengthens the company. It adds inventory for us. It's oil-weighted inventory. And to some of your comments earlier in your introduction, uh, oil and, uh, is where the margin is right now. Natural gas has got a, a great future. But some of us, including myself, spent the first 25 years of our career, 30 years of our career, uh, with natural gas-based companies, and we always uh, the future always looked bright. And uh, today, the margins are, are and have been for quite some time. Quite honestly, Jim, have been with crude oil. And so, for us, having a crude oil weighted acquisition to strengthen our already crude oil uh, weighted company, it's a great fit. It, it does build us some more scale, uh, gives us more scale, more inventory. And on top of that, Jim, what a lot of people don't understand is um, with a 300,000 acre position, that is a quite large position that we're getting with this recent transaction. Our geoscience team, geologists, are really excited about what future potential, even outside of the Bakken lies. Because if you recall, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, when, when you visited with us up in the Bakken, uh, it was, that was some of the early days of Bakken development, but the basin was 50 years old. There have been, been other horizons we've been producing from. And so we're excited about what lies ahead on that acreage. And, and that'll be for the next generation and, and the one behind that, you know, uh, to uncover. But it's well, going to be exciting. Well, Rick, you told me at the time in 2011 that what would occur is, is that you might find a lot of oil, but you know what? There's not a lot of transport out of the basin. Has that improved enough to make it so it's worthwhile to do a lot of drilling there? Yeah, so I think uh, what we did is we did over time build out infrastructure and so right now, the Wilson Basin's in a great spot. We've been producing a little over a million barrels a day for several years now. Good takeaway capacity, good infrastructure, and it's just a great place to operate. Wonderful, uh, you know, uh, regulatory environment. And so we're, we're just, it's just a great place to, to do business. Now, we found uh, when Mr. Trump became president, a lot of people felt that would be terrific for oil. But it, what it did was unleash the dis- people got undisciplined. And you told me that. It, the people kind of went nuts. They drilled and drilled and drilled, and that drove the price down. Right now, there is good discipline. Could that happen again if Trump is elected president? Well, I think, <clears throat> you know, excuse me, Jim, uh, where you saw a lot of the activity increase, quite honestly, was with the natural gas producers. I think if you look at uh, in the Permian Basin, we did see a couple of things were going on. Number one, people had to hold their acreage. So either you go out and, and drill to hold that acreage or you potentially lose the leases. There was a certain amount of that. There were also a large number of independent producers, the non-public producers that that um, really looked at that at that price signal as a as an opportunity to really increase activity, and they did increased ac- uh, increased activity, increased production. Most of the public pr- producers, we we held our discipline, as we said, and that that worked out pretty well. In on, on top of that, a lot of the uh, the private operators actually have been have been bought out, have been have sold to some of the public entities. So I think what you're going to see in the future is more and more discipline. Uh, you know, and I think even the natural gas producers uh, saw uh, prices spiked. They got after it, and uh, and and here here we are again, back to where we were in the past. And so, uh, I think I think people have learned their lesson. All right, one last question for me. Uh, you have a very big buyback now. The buyback is humongous versus the size of the company. Do you think that the people who got stock in this acquisition will they be selling? Or they'd be holding because you could really shrink the float here. Right. Well, I, th- I think our plan is let's let's just uh, it, we think it's a great u- uh, use for capital. We have this excess cash flow that we're that we're continuing to generate. We will, you know, we we 
recall, we run everything on a mid-cycle oil price of $75. And so whether we're at, you know, down in our low break even in the $40, $50 range, all the way up to 100 you know, we think the, the 75 is a good mid-cycle price to plan your business on. And we're a, we're a tremendous value. And so we're going to continue to to buy our shares back. And as you mentioned, we did increase the authorization from $3 billion up to $5 billion, and uh, we're off to a good start on that. So whether whether uh, the holders of those equities that came with the most recent transaction keep it uh, or not uh, will, will remain to be seen. But, uh, you know, I think – and I think – I believe they think it's a great investment long term. Well, I, I got to tell you, Rick, with this acquisition and with the, these numbers, you jumped to the head of the class. I've been looking for some. I, I like Kotara. Uh, Kotara's got a little too much natural gas in light of what you said. Absolutely. And we lost Mr. Sheffield's company. We would love to always love Pioneer. But it seems like Devin is the one to want to be in. And I think it's terrific that you came on the show to talk about it. Rick Monk, we president CEO of Devin. And great to see you again, sir. OK, good seeing you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Rick. Rick. Rick Moncrief is the dean of the industry. Med Money's back in. Coming up, hit us with your best shot. An electrified fast fire lightning round is next. It is time. It's over the lightning round. This is Rick Rock Fire. Never seen him. Let's talk. Bye bye bye. So just because of the cold scarf, sorry, my staff is late on the now. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready? Ski that's over the lightning round. Let's go to Sandy in Tennessee. Sandy. Hey, Jim, big booyah to you. Great to have you How on you the show. What's afraid? going on? Doing well. Thank you for asking. How can I help? All right. Can you throw some lights on, a light on Dollar General? DLTR? Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree. DLTR is Dollar Tree. Okay, the problem with Dollar Tree is that people, I think, have discovered that the small form is no longer working. They'd rather go to Walmart, which is a buy, or Costco if they can afford the membership fee, which they should because it pays back quickly. Nathan in Oregon. Nathan. Hi, Jim. Hey, thanks for all your advice. Of course. I wanted to ask you about this stock. Uh, last year, you recommended this one, and I bought it for my dividend portfolio. The stock is up 20% since that time. With a P of 18 and a 4.8% yield, should I add more? Uh, the ticker symbol is OKE, One Oak. I think One Oak is terrific. I would indeed buy more. I think it's a sensational company. It does, I'd rather have a yield over five, but 4.77 is real good. Chad in Wisconsin. Chad. The main Jimmy Chill. How you doing there, Jimmy? Chill Booyah man. Chill man here. Chill man ready to work for you. What do you got? Oh, an extended booyah weekend here, as a matter of fact. It's synthetic, hey, uh, it's synthetic the- Thursday. Yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, the question I have uh, is a company, a medical supplies company. Uh, it's been performing quite well. I'm kind of at neutral right now. It was making a fairly decent consolidation on the way up in price. Looked pretty good. But now I'm starting to wonder, minus today's you know overall stock correction, uh, the stock name is Dextron. Dextron? Dextron? Yeah, D-X-C-M. Oh, De- Dexcom. Okay, look, Dexcom had a real bad miss. They still really haven't fully explained why that is. I've got to tell you, I give you a reason why. One of them is because of Abbott's Libre, which is just crushing it. So anyway, I'd stay away from Dexcom. I need to go to John in Kentucky. John. Hey, Jim. John from Kentucky. Long John, what's happening? Listener and a real fan of you and the show. As a matter of fact, oh, I don't believe you. I'd still be in the market without you, man. Oh, thank you, man. That's you what I need you. I need you in the market. We have days like today it. where you got to start thinking, hey, maybe I can make some money here. What's going on? Well, I own CRISPR technology, CRSP. Uh, okay, CRISPR, I happen to have a sweet spot for. I do not think that it is as dangerous as others think because it does have some explosive technology. I would be a buyer of CRISPR. Let's go to Stan in Illinois. Stan. Hi, Jim. Stan from Peoria, Illinois, charter member right. of the club. Oh, thank you, Stan. We got to work harder for you. Got to work harder. Up all night tonight. Oh. Write that down. Okay, what's going on? Well, I've owned uh, Regional Bank Key Corp for the dividend, currently 5.7%, but their stock's stuck in a 14 to $16 range. I wonder, should I keep it? Yes, definitely keep Key. Key is very, very strong. A terrific, terrific bank. I wish Mr. Gorman would come on. I know that board, too. They're ter- they are fabulous. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. 
Coming up, crypto was crushed in the sell-off, but Kramer's not throwing in the towel on tokens. More next. It's crypto's turn in the woodshed. We're all transfixed by the evisceration of Bitcoin and Ethereum during this most recent downdraft of the SP 500. We've been told these are storeholds of value, something that shouldn't get crushed along with the stock market. If anything, they should hold their own, if not go higher. The collapse of Ethereum, as measured by the recently minted Fidelity Ethereum Fund, which fell from $32 to $24 in a handful of days, was jarring. Wasn't this the transactional crypto, the one that can actually be used to buy things? Wasn't it supposed to offset everything in the world? To which I say, give me a break. When you buy crypto, you're buying an unproven asset that may also be owned by a lot of people using borrowed money who just got margin calls, margin calls they couldn't meet. The iShares Bitcoin Trust wasn't much better, falling from $37 to $30, same period. The various proxy stocks, the micro strategies, the marathon digital holdings, they fared slightly better, but none of them behaved like what you call a hedge against falling stock prices. And you know what? That makes perfect sense. The pitch for crypto is that it's like digital gold, a safe storehold of value. But that's more like a pitch for what it could be in the future. For the moment, almost everything crypto is still hostage to the general gravitational pull of the stock market because you have many of the same owners, so they have the same sets of problems. On the other hand, actual gold has distinguished itself as the storehold of value this year against pretty much everything. Unbeknownst to everyone who's still fretting that inflation is about to have a comeback, we're in an extraordinary bear market for commodities. But not this precious one, which is up more than 15 percent, beating the pants of virtually all the conceivable competition. After a very long time doing nothing, gold has become a consistent riser since 2018 and a fabulous performer since the Fed stopped raising rates last fall, going from about 1800 to over 2400. Now, it's held up under every onslaught. And there's a simple reason, as we heard from from Amar El Jundi. He's the CEO of Agnico Eagle Mines, a great performer during this period. It's getting increasingly hard and expensive to find precious metals. The world's barely replacing this ancient storehold of value, and only about 1% of the entire worth of gold is found each year. There's true scarcity value, something crypto can't truly provide as an asset class, or at least that we don't think it can. In fact, gold has become so difficult to find that most of the miners who perform poorly themselves because their costs are too high. Of the majors, the only one that's delivered consistently is Ignico Eagle, and that's because they mine chiefly in their own backyard of Canada, where costs are under control and there are far fewer mistakes made than their compadres. The stock's up double the price of gold this year. Meanwhile, we aren't sure of anything crypto, despite what the apostles say on television or in their myriad ads. For example, we show this price of Solana, a crypto coin, every day. But does anyone even know anything about it? There's no clamoring for a Solana ETF. It's just out there getting promoted by who knows who or why. But gold, it's a beloved metal, something we can see by how Costco sells out of its members-only gold bars every day before most customers can get them. Unlike crypto, gold is something you can physically take with you on the run from an unstable regime. It has value everywhere around the globe, no questions asked. Now, perhaps somewhat ironically, I believe in both gold and crypto, but for wildly different reasons. I like crypto because there's a consistency that will always take it up after decline. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. I'd be a buyer of Ethereum and of Bitcoin down here for one simple reason, one simple imperative. Our budget deficit is out of control, so countless people will buy cryptocurrencies as alternatives to the dollar because they imagine a future of rampant inflation. These people don't have the heft to influence the bond market, but they can definitely take up Ethereum and Bitcoin. Maybe one day crypto will be a genuine hedge against inflation. For now, though, it's simply too young to act as a hedge against anything. We don't know how the supply of these coins works. We don't know if they can be trusted, but I'm confident it will work over time. It just needs more seasoning. And that's why I say buy gold and buy Bitcoin. You need as many hedges as you can get here. They can't all work at once. But I bet over time, they'll all work out well. I like to say there's always a bull market somewhere. I promise I'll find it just for you right here on Mad Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warn its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.